legacy and what the Lord has taught my husband and me over the last 44 years, almost 45. I'm going to start with a poem by Amy Carmichael, who happens to be one of my favorite authors, but was my mother's probably very favorite author. And it, it was this, from prayer that asks that I may be shielded from winds that beat on thee, from fearing when I should aspire, from faltering when I should climb higher, from silken self, O captain, free thy soldier who would follow thee. It's called the captain of my salvation. I am continually humbled and continually amazed at what my parents wrote and what they represented as soldiers in the kingdom. And so I, <clears throat> I come very, I come like a pauper. Um, I have learned and grown so much from reading their works. And I'm sorry that I've gotten emotional, but they were pretty amazing people. And they were not perfect, of course. I think many people who aspire to go to the mission field may think that Jim Elliott was practically perfect. I think of my mother as practically perfect in every way, like Mary Poppins. But I know that they struggled with sin. I know they were very vulnerable to hurts. And yet they were determined to follow the Lord Jesus. So most of you know probably that they met at Wheaton College, which is also where I went to school. They were Greek majors. I always hasten to say I was not as high in my grades as my parents were. So I'm not exactly like either one of them in the uh, in to when I'm done, there's there's a background noise does everybody else hear it or is it just me yeah i heard it yes would you uh, uh, just note to everybody could you please make sure that everyone's mic is muted just mm -hmm. so valerie is the only one with her mic on muted thank you so i'm going to share um some things from my father's journal which some people who have read it uh, of course would recognize and most people have of course heard the famous uh, quote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. But these things I picked out from his journals because when I first read them in uh, probably my twenties, I was of course amazed as most people are. And then I read them again as I got ready to write the book about their love story called Devotedly. And his words were his, his life. I mean, he wrote exactly what was on his heart. And he was restless. He was eager. And somebody called him a dramatic. You know, I'll just move aside the paper that I had it on. Um, anyway, that he was um, dramatic. And also, he had a flair. Uh, he loved to quote poetry and stand up and act, and he was also quite funny. But his drama really was in his heart with the Lord, you know, always seeking after and then hating himself for his weaknesses and sin, and then glorying in the glory of Christ, glorying in the, the joy that Christ had in going to obedience, going in obedience to the cross. So he wrote, he makes his ministers a flame of fire when he was studying Psalm 104. Am I ignitable? He asked. God deliver me from the dread asbestos of other things. The love of the world, that is. Saturate me with the oil of the spirit that I may be a flame. But flame is transient, often short-lived. Canst thou bear this, my soul, short life? In me there dwells the spirit of the great short-lived. 
Jesus died at the age of 33. My father died at 28. Whose zeal for God's house consumed him, and he has promised baptism with the Spirit and with fire. Make me thy fuel, flame of God. He had some inkling during his college years that he may have a short life and that he may die early. And yet he looked forward with, with much longing to being able to say, see Christ, his captain. And he wrote, Father, if thou wilt let me go to South America to labor with thee and to die, I pray that thou wilt let me go soon. Nevertheless, not my will. And that was probably two years before he actually got to go into Ecuador. A few weeks later in his journal, he wrote, I prayed a strange prayer today, and this is probably my very favorite of, his, of the quotes that people don't hear because it's buried in the journal. He said, I covenanted with the Father that he would do either of two things, either glorify himself to the utmost in me or slay me. By his grace, I shall not have his second best, for he heard me, I believe, so that now I have nothing to look forward to but a life of sacrificial sonship or heaven soon. Perhaps tomorrow, what a prospect. He also wrote this quote that I have in a nice frame on my wall, be on guard, be on guard, oh my soul, of complicating your environment so that you have neither time nor room for growth. In other words, loosen the clutch and the grasp of things in this world. He was consumed with longing to know and to do God's will. He, when he told my mother right before she graduated that he loved her, he also told her that he felt God was calling him to the single life on the mission field. So I always often think of God's sovereignty in allowing the passion and the drama of my father's heart to tell my mother that he thought he was supposed to be single, and yet at the same time he felt he should tell her that he loved her, and it was a, it was a, a a complete shock to my mother to hear those words because she also had been taught by her parents that a man does not tell a woman that he loves her unless he's ready to ask her to marry him. So uh, in those two and a half to three years of waiting before he got to Ecuador, they started writing letters. It was actually four years that they started writing because my mother was, was graduating from college when she, when he told her that he loved her. And then the, the most amazing and profound picture of the cross was shown to them through the shadow of a, to, a cross on a tombstone when they were sitting in a cemetery, which was significant because they both knew they had to die to themselves. And so during those years, they wrote each other pretty regularly, and they only saw each other five times in five years. The last year was when they both got to Ecuador. My mother arrived two months after my father did. And he would remind her things like, Satan says, go and work, but God says, go and sacrifice. And my mother was all about hard work. She really did work hard throughout her whole life. And so I think of the things that my father influenced me by these words, um, just his determination, his longing to bring glory to God. Uh, <clears throat> he laid the foundation for my mother and I to go into the, to live with the Alka or the Wyodani Indians just by his passion to go to them to bring the gospel, and yet he didn't get to bring the gospel to them. <clears throat> and through his waiting and his prayer life and his obedience to the call, God made the way for him to actually see the Alcas, which he was actually very thrilled to see face to face. Um, I found the quote that I was trying to uh, say of somebody, somebody who has said of him, 
Jim Elliott was an intense, self-assured young man with a dramatic flair. But because my mother was hardworking, she actually uh, got Greek down in her head pretty well. And then they learned Spanish together in Ecuador. And she actually was faster at learning Spanish than my father was. And uh, that made him pretty embarrassed and insecure. Um, I do believe God just gave her a gift for languages. But <clears throat> my father's death, of course, that story of the five men being killed went around the world and was a shock to thousands and thousands of people. And yet, this is what he had said, Lord, if my life could be a short life on earth, then may the zeal for you consume me. Hi, Raul. So I would, I would like to focus a little more on, uh, well, not a little more, I'm doing both. I'm what my mother taught me and what my father taught me through his writing. Um, my mother, of course, I remember well, and she died in 2015. And I prayed and prayed and prayed for the last 10 years of her life that the Lord would heal her of dementia. <clears throat> God didn't answer that prayer. But my mother's love for me was deep and abiding and wonderful. And what, that's why I said she was practically perfect in every way. Um, I don't feel that I was spoiled. She expected me to work. She expected me to obey. She did not pour out tons of gifts and things upon me, though when she did buy clothing for me or a gift for Christmas or birthday, she was generous and kind. But as a little girl, she took absolute good care of my physical needs. And when she saw me struggling with wanting to make sure I spent enough time with each child alone, reading to them or just talking or praying with them, she would say, Val, when you were little, all I thought I had to do for you was to love you and feed you and put you to bed clean and read out loud to you. Maybe sing, sing hymns, she, read, she sang a lot of hymns to me. And she said, you don't really have to spend extra time individually with each of your children. Of course, she was always overwhelmed that I had three and then four and then five and then six and then seven and then eight. But, uh, and, and you barely do have time to, to do that. But I was thinking of Susanna Wesley, who had 10 children, 17 altogether, but seven died in childhood. Um, but for 10 children, she tried to give at least an hour per week, not to all 10, but within the two weeks she gave an hour individually. So that's what I was trying to do. Anyway, my mother was just smiling at me and saying, just love them, take care of them, teach them to be obedient. And that's your main job. <clears throat> she was very affectionate with me. Hugs and kisses were regular, but with um, the Howard family, they were not. So she had determined she would be more affectionate than they had been. Her, her family was the Howards. Um, but the special bedtime routine is, of course, something I remember so well, reading the Bible to me or telling the stories in her own words and then praying with me and always teaching me that my father had given me the good shepherd, Jesus, and that the good shepherd was leading us wherever we were. And when we were in the jungle, we were, of course, among very dangerous creatures. The Lord allowed, uh, the Lord protected us so that no, no snake ever bit us and no poisonous spider ever gave us any illness. Uh, the worst thing that happened to me was bumblebee stings one day when we lived among the Alcas, but I just remember having a ball playing in the river. We had a baby otter for a while, which was a joy. Um, building fires with the Alka kids. Of course, my grandparents were, weren't too thrilled about that because of the safety of it. And we had little knives that we could quiddle sticks with and the Lord protected me all the way. But one particular story, and I know some children are listening, one particular story about God's protection is when I went to bed in the little hut without any walls and I was on a bamboo bed and my mother was in a hammock right next to me. 
and she prayed. We sang, Jesus, tender shepherd, hear me. Bless thy little lamb tonight. Through the darkness be thou near me. Keep me safe till morning light. There are three lovely verses to that. I won't quote them all, but she would sing me many wonderful hymns. But I remember especially that one. And one night, as she woke up to stir the logs, to, to push the logs together, to keep the fire going that we had to have because it was quite cool at nighttime. She looked over at my bed as she always did. And there was a, a black circle on my stomach. I was underneath a blanket. And so she touched it with the stick that she touched the, that she pushed the logs together with. And it was a black snake and it just, smoothly curled, uncurled itself and slid off into the jungle. And of course, it could have been very poisonous. She didn't tell me at the time. I was probably too young to even understand, but the Lord protected us amazingly. And uh, I'll never forget seeing an ocelot being caged uh, by the Alcas. They had set a trap for it. And in the middle of the night, they woke us up to come and look at the ocelot in the trap. And I remember thinking how fierce and angry it looked, and the Lord protected us from those night creatures, which were panthers and ocelots. And so anyway, there were anacondas in the river. We never saw them that I remember. So I'm just so very grateful for how God um, protected my mother and me and very clearly led her <clears throat> to live with the Alka Indians along with Rachel Saint. And I'm so thankful that she never showed any fear to me. <clears throat> if I had seen her alarm and fear and worry all the time, that would have made me alarmed and fearful and worried all the time. And I never saw it. So I'm very, very grateful for that example. She said that maybe inside she might have been fearful at times, but she never let me know it. And in that bedtime routine, there was this confidence and security that the Lord was watching over us. As uh, meal time was the main thing I had to come to, I had to obey her about. Uh, of course, I was always hungry. And uh, we had sometimes jungle trips with the Alcas where we didn't have anything to eat for most of the day. We might have had a little cup of chicha, which is chewed up manioc, cooked and then chewed up by the Alca women. And that gave us some starch for the day. But we went one time all day long. And when we arrived where we were supposed to be, my mother looked at me and said, are you hungry? And I said, yes. And she said, what would you like to eat? And I said, rice and egg. So rice and egg was a common food if we had eggs. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, the Lord used her to teach me to look at things practically and to do things as efficiently as I could. And yet I still struggle in my own lack of efficiency. Um, she taught me that obedience was very important and that I was never to talk back to her, which I don't remember doing, but she taught me that it mattered what we said and what we did. Uh, we were to bring glory to God in all of our behavior. So when we actually moved to the States, everything practical had to be done well. I had to wash the dishes well, thoroughly. I could not waste water. I had to turn off lights when I was finished in a room. I had to dust even the baseboards, the edges and the windowsills. Everything had to be thoroughly done. And I'm very thankful that she taught me that. But always teaching spiritual truths, especially not to live by our feelings, which is, of course, what she and my dad had to constantly uh, remind themselves as they had given up their hearts to Christ and they were willing to go even if they weren't positive, willing to go to Ecuador, even if they didn't know when or if they would get married. But it was in that last year at, in Ecuador when they were six months learning Spanish together, and they were more and more convinced that someday God would bring them together. And amazingly, my father even said to her, it might be another five years that we, before we can get married, because he was so sure that he'd have to live in the jungle by himself, or at least with another uh, male missionary. But the Lord opened the way for them to get married in October of 1953. So I remember her saying as an adult, underneath are the everlasting arms. And so many of you who have heard Gateway to Joy, she always started with that. Um, you are loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are the everlasting arms. 
And of course that was lived by her uh, in her, her expression of acceptance of what God had done. He had taken her husband, her acceptance of how the Alcas or the Quechua sometimes treated her, her willingness to serve without uh, fanfare and without saying to anybody, look at me, everybody, look at what I've done. She was uh, completely secure in what God had called her to do. And it was not, it was always not about her. And this is what I finally learned when I was about 40. It's not about me and the fact that I am Jim and Elizabeth Elliot's daughter. It's about Christ and what he has done for us. So she, she showed that to me, that God's love is complete. It is, it's not people that we're looking for um, praise and admiration from. It's simply uh, knowing that God loves us because we're his children. And I depended completely on her word. She meant what she said. She never said anything vain to me. Uh, she would not say she was going to punish me and then not punish me if I disobeyed. Uh, her words were true. So that truth is an amazing legacy to me. Completely true and never any silly threats. Uh, she was careful in her work. She expected me to be careful and to do a job well. Uh, if a task is once begun, never leave it till it's done, she would say. Be the labor great or small, do it well or not at all. Grammar and sentence structure were very important. Correct words. As Mark Twain said, the difference between the wrong word and the right word is like the difference between a lightning bug and lightning. I love that quote. Um, so she expected me to obey and I was spanked soundly if I disobeyed and I knew I was disappointing her when I disobeyed and I remember being so disappointed and upset with myself. I disobeyed. But that courage and love of adventure that both my parents had was given to me, uh, so much so that I often have a love of adventure and longing for it without, with the, with the zeal for it, but without much knowledge of what it might mean. Um, I think of, again, that, that quote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And what, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? What's most important? It's living for him and his glory. Um, through waiting and prayer, they were the hallmarks of their lives, uh, those, especially those five years. And as my mother carried on the missionary work with the Kichwas, do you know what she said to my father as he left to go to the Alcas? She said, what will I do if you don't come back? And he said, teach the believers, darling, teach the believers. She, had, she did that the rest of her life. Her love for the Alcas gave me love for the Indians uh, as well as the Quechua Indians. I mean, I was just always, expected to love them because God loved them. And so the impact of their lives, of course, has made a huge difference to me. And uh, I just want to take a little break from, from talking about their legacy. Of course, the obedience, the truth, the prayers, all of those things went into their, their expression of who they followed. They didn't follow the world. And many of you have heard my father's quote about Americans don't need a call to the mission field. They need a kick in the seat of their pants. And uh, he felt that too many Americans were just too comfortable and satisfied. And it's still very true. It's still very true. So we'll take a break. And uh, I'll drink some water. And then maybe some of you would send in a question or two to... Sashko, is that, is that good? Yep, that's good, thank you, Valerie. We'll take, we'll take a short break now. Ooh, Valerie. Okay, I was going to mention uh, some of my mother's books and I'm sure most of you just, because you got on, you had already, you know of my mother's books. Um, but I wanna tell you probably my 
two favorites are the two biographies that she did. One is called A Chance to Die. It's about Amy Carmichael, and it's an amazing book. Uh, she did a lot of hard work uh, to read up on her, went to Donovore twice, um, <clears throat> talked, of course, a lot to the Donovore Fellowship in England, and uh, did a beautiful, beautiful book of her life. And she, did, she does slightly uh, hint at the weaknesses or the sins of Amy. Of course, I wouldn't be able to enumerate because she didn't do, make that clear at all. But there, you know, there was there was definite human weakness, just that, like there was in my father and in my mother. Um, so that's a chance to die. And then the second one, of course, is my father's biography. And when I read that, I was continually just amazed, continually thrilled that that was my daddy. And uh, every once in a while, when I was younger, my mother would say, oh, Val, you're so much like your dad. And that would please me and, and make me wonder, you know, what, what, what it was. It was mainly that love of adventure, spontaneity, and sometimes craziness. Uh, did any questions come in, Sashko? So we have a number of questions here. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, about, about Ecuador or about my mother? Uh, it's neither, actually. Quite a few people okay. are asking for an update on Lars. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, okay. Maybe. Yeah. Lars is right now living in Florida with his brother, whom he had been estranged from for many years. So it's a good thing his brother asked him to come and live with him. I think they are about seven or eight years apart. Lars is the elder. And um, so you can pray for Lars. Um, he does have a home in Little Rock. He sold the home that my mother and he lived in for 34 years or 36 years. And uh, that was in Massachusetts. So he has some dementia, but he's doing pretty well. He's always been a pretty active man and always took walks and um yeah does that answer that question thank you uh, another question is uh, will there be a second biography of becoming elizabeth elliott yes there will be a volume two mm -hmm, because the first one stops in 1963 and ellen vaughn is working on the rest of it it'll probably take another year to two years to finish that volume there's probably a lot more to be said in that biography than there was in the first one. Though there, that biography I thought was absolutely wonderful. It's Becoming Elizabeth Elliot by Ellen Vaughn. Mm -hmm. And it you. is an authorized biography. Thank you, Valerie. Um, there's um, another one here. There was one quote that you referenced, um, uh, that you framed, the one you framed. Uh, could you please repeat the quote or say which book it was in? Um, started with Be On Guard. Oh yeah, that's in my father's uh, journal. Be on guard, O oh my soul, of complicating your environment so that you have neither time nor room for growth. In other words, take time to meditate on God's word. Don't spend so much time on worldly things and TV and internet, of course, takes way much more time than it should because it it interrupts our Bible reading or our prayer times. And I'm still learning that. I'm still trying to say no to all of the dings, all of the uh, notifications on the phone. <clears throat> so it's, it's from his journal, Be On Guard, O oh My Soul, of Complicating Your environment, environment so that you have neither time nor room for growth. Anything else before I go on? We'll, we'll finish this section. Uh of uh, questions with, with the last one. Do you remember what color were your father's eyes? <laughs> That's a question I've never been asked. Uh, no, I really don't. <laughs> Maybe from some pictures we could tell that they were brown, but I'm not positive. Gilbert, do you have any idea? Gilbert's quiet. He's I my, think they were pro I, I think they were probably brown. That's what you I know, that would that, that would be my guess, Valerie. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, so 
I'm going to share my own testimony. I call it my adult testimony, though I did give my heart to Christ in a serious way when I was 14. Now, everything my mother taught me and said to me as a child, I, I obeyed, I listened, I learned, I believed. So I believed that Jesus was my savior. But at the ages of 10, 11, 12, we had moved to the States when I was eight and a half. So I started fourth grade in a public, small public school, which was actually a good school. And, but when I began to go into adolescence, I was much more distracted by friends. And uh, <clears throat> when my mother remarried the second time, which was in January of 1968, uh, he, Addison Leach was a Presbyterian minister and professor of theology. And uh, we lived in Franconia, New Hampshire, which is where we had been living. My mother and I had been living since 1963. And uh, that summer we moved to Massachusetts because he was going to teach at Gordon Conwell Seminary, which is where my husband, Walt Shepard, went to seminary. So he sent me to a Presbyterian Christian youth missions conference. It changed my life. Uh, I, as I said, I certainly believed everything my mother had taught me, but sitting in church when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, it went in one ear and out the other. I remember just being cold in this little community church that had been started by Christian Women's Club in Sugar Hill, New Hampshire. I ate my mother's mints from her purse while she played the organ. And I was in Sunday school, and I remember being frustrated that I seemed to be the only one that wanted to answer questions, but I was basically bored in church. So when I went to this conference, it was about 300 high school students with some very good preachers, Jerry Kirk, Bruce Thielman, and the third one escapes, the name, the name escapes me, but anyway, they were wonderful. <clears throat> and I'll never forget the singing of Christian hymns by those teenagers. They had the boys and the girls sep separated in the auditorium that we sat in. It was an outdoor auditorium, but we got to hear these three different preachers and I knew the Lord was calling me to himself to be his disciple. And it was at that week that I understood I had to get more serious about learning his word, loving him, praying. So I was 14. And I'm very, very grateful that my stepfather sent me to that conference. That conference has been going on for about 120 years, Presbyterian Youth Conference. So <clears throat> I went into, from, from that experience of really wanting to be serious about my faith, I told my mother when I got home from that conference, I want to start a journal and I want to read the Bible every day like you and my dad did. I said to her, and she said, that's wonderful. So she gave me a journal, and I already had a good Bible, and I began. And I, within three weeks, was faltering at the daily habit. And uh, I would go a few weeks and keep saying to myself, I need to read my Bible, and knew that it was the right thing and the good thing to do. But let me just say, for the next five to six years, I continued to struggle with the regular daily Bible reading and daily prayer. I just was not as determined and persevering as my mother was. And so that's why I say I'm very different from my mother, but I dearly love the example she set. Um, my first two years of college were very difficult because I was not willing to seriously study. I wanted to have fun. Uh, but in my second two years of college, I got a single room, which helped me tremendously and helped me study. And then I began to love my English lit major. And then I fell in love with my husband um, my junior year of college because he was living in my mother's house. I didn't get to know him until really the following fall, but my mother kept writing about this Walt Shepherd, And I was curious. I was very curious and uh, came home for Christmas. He was there for just one week before he went home for Christmas. He was a boarder because my mother had asked at the seminary for uh, a guy to come and help her with my stepfather who was dying of cancer. And my stepfather did die at the beginning of my sophomore year when I was 18. And it was a very sad time. It was also a huge lesson in the sovereignty of God 
because I had been pretty determined that he was going to be healed by the Lord. And in June, he died in September. In June, my mother came to me and he said, she said, Val, I think you might have to accept the fact that he probably will die. And I said, but mama, all the people that are praying for him and you know God can heal and he, he, he just needs to accept that, that God will heal him. And I was just sure. Um, and she just kept reminding me that he didn't have the will to live. He really wanted to just go on to heaven. And so when I said goodbye to him before I started my sophomore year, and this really was my first big lesson in the sovereignty of God in my own heart, <clears throat> I said to daddy, he's lying on a bed, of course, and he was not doing well. I said, Daddy, when I see you again, it'll be Thanksgiving and you'll be all well. And I said it with a smile and my normal optimistic spirit. And he looked at me very seriously, he said, no, Val, I'm dying. And I gave him a kiss goodbye and got, and got to Wheaton the next uh, day and a half, I drove, drove with my cousin to Wheaton. And Sunday night, I moved into my dorm. Monday, my mother called me during this day and said he was in a coma and that he would probably die soon. So that was Friday that I said goodbye to him. Saturday drove to Wheaton. Monday, he died. Well, do you know the peace of the Lord that passes all understanding? It just fell over me. Um, no other way to put it. I just knew right away when my mother said that he had died that God was sovereign. God knew what he was doing and that I couldn't demand something that I wanted. And I, I just understood suddenly that I could accept God's way instead of my own way and what my mother must have gone through in uh, hearing that my dad had died. She had said, you know, he's yours, Lord. And she had said she had hoped that they would live a long life in Ecuador being missionaries, but the Lord took him. And the same way my mother and I both uh, grieved, and I know she grieved in a much harder way because, of course, it was her second husband, and she loved him so much. Um, but that was really understanding that God knows what he's doing, and God will give you peace if you trust him and accept him. <clears throat> this is the true grace of God in which you stand, says First Peter 5. So, I get married to Walt Shepard right after college, May of 1976. And I am thinking, I am going to be a wonderful mother. I'm gonna have 10 to 12 children. And I'm going to have um, a wonderful ministry to the women in the churches or church. And my husband's going to be a wonderful minister because we're wonderful people. <laughs> and I wasn't consciously saying that. But that was a subconscious hope. And uh, we go into our years of ministry first in Southwest Louisiana, a place I did not like. The physical looks of Southwest Louisiana is flat land, it's cane fields and, and uh, swamp. And I had come from New Hampshire with mountains and glorious fall days with those colors of the trees. And so that first year, Though I was very happy to be married to Walt, I uh, was not accepting where he had put us. And I just kept thinking, well, he's going to put us somewhere better, somewhere that's prettier. And uh, three years we were there. Actually, my husband had been there for one full year before I got there. And our first baby was born at the end of our first year of marriage. His name is Walter. And uh, so I was focused on having a child and the joy of being a mother and I was not really focused on serving and dying to self, serving the people in the church. But the Lord brought me to a book called uh, What Happens When Women Pray. The first book I read right before I read that one was also a huge influence. It was called A Severe Mercy by Sheldon Van Auken. And that really convicted me that I was not reading the Bible seriously and seeking him seriously. So because of that book, I made a pact with the Lord that I would promise to read 30 days without missing a day because every January I had been doing this starting and then stopping. And I said, the Lord, I want to see how your word is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword. And I started in the old Testament as many of us do when we start reading the Bible. And 
And that's why in the years past, I'd always gotten bogged down, probably in Leviticus. But at this point in my reading, I was in Jeremiah, and I came upon the verses, Thy word was found, and it, it became to me the joy and delight. Of my, thy word was found, and I did eat it, and it became to me the joy and the delight of my life. I was really, I was really blown away by that verse. It suddenly came alive. It jumped out at me, and I thought, this is it. This is why I'm supposed to be reading the Bible. It is the joy and delight of my life. And uh, we moved to Mississippi <clears throat> a year and a half later. Our son was 21 months old. We moved to Laurel, Mississippi, which is just two, two hours north of where I am now. And my husband started a ministry there of uh, a, peace, a Presbyterian church. And it was in Laurel that we had four more children. So when we left Laurel, I had five children and I was all about, I'm going to have a huge family and everything's going to be wonderful because I'd read T Cheaper by the Dozen and I'd read Little Women and I'd read Five Little Peppers and how they grow, grew. And I was just all sure that everything was going to be wonderful, but I didn't calculate sin into the picture. My husband's sin, my sin, my children's sin. I had not grown up with any conflict with Indian children or even in high school. I, in, it was actually in junior high was the first time I recognized there was some irritating people around. First time in junior high. And I remember being kind of annoyed, but not too concerned about it because I went on my merry way. And here I am now raising children struggling with my own sin, struggling with my children's sin, and especially being critical of my husband. So that was the wrong way that I was going. <clears throat> I was all about writing lists. I see a friend from Mississippi watching. She teases me about my uh, three by five cards and the chores that I had for each of the children each day. And I wanted to be so organized and I could be organized for one day and then the next day be completely, forget the organization. I'm I'm very um, I'm up and down, back and forth, not very determined all the way. So anyway, long story short, 15 years of marriage, and we have moved to California. And I didn't want to be in California, even though we were in a beautiful spot. Orange County is beautiful. Of course, the Pacific Ocean is beautiful. But I wanted to be overseas. I felt that raising children overseas would be a much easier, quote unquote, much better uh, environment for them. And so I was pretty disgruntled the first five years we were in California. And I, I looked down on people who looked down on people, which is not a good way to be. It's pharisaical. And I looked down on people that didn't have it together. And yet I knew in the deepest part of my heart that I didn't have it together that my sin was in the way. My children's sin would make me upset and frustrated. And so things kind of began to snowball so that by the 10th or 11th year of our marriage, I was beginning to think, how in the world did I think that we could raise a wonderful Christian family when these children are sinners and I'm a sinner? And I really wasn't saying the the phrase it's all about me but that's actually the way i was living i better do this right or i am not going to be um, admired by people i may not even be admired by my mother although she was always encouraging when she came to visit us she was always prayerful for the children she was always telling me that i was doing a good job and yet i was saying no mom i'm not doing a good job i'm so inconsistent and uh the Lord brought, in 1992, a study through my husband's going to a pastor's conference where he heard a man say, Hi, my name is Jack, and I am a recovering Pharisee. He came home from that conference, and he looked at me, and he said, Val, would you be willing to do a Bible study with me? And I said, I was holding our seventh child, a baby, in our arms, my arms. I said, how much time will it take? But I liked the idea of doing a Bible study with my husband because we'd never done one before. <clears throat> so we began a study of Galatians. 
And it was a written study by this man named Jack. And his name was Jack Miller. He's in heaven now. But we worked about six months to finish that study because we had to take breaks because of how much time the children and homeschooling took, of course. But we listened to tapes. We had to memorize many of the verses in Galatians. And we had to answer questions, which by after that, we would send a fax of our homework to a counselor who was on the East Coast. The only way to meet at the proper at the right time for both of us was early in the morning. It was 7.30 for him on the East Coast, 4.30 for us. We did it once every two weeks with this one hour uh, with our counselor. Well, <clears throat> do you know... Uh, it really did change our lives because we suddenly realized in that study that we had been living just like Pharisees. And that though we had amazing parents, my husband grew up in Congo with wonderful missionary parents. I had had amazing parents. We both had loved our, our uh, lives on the mission field. And I had been thinking as we lived those first five years in California, it's so much better to be in the mission field because the kids wouldn't have all this stuff to deal with. They wouldn't have these movies they'd want to go see. They wouldn't have to go see Disney World or Disneyland. They didn't have to have all these toys because I had no toys, hardly any in Ecuador. So that's the way I wanted to raise my children. But this study helped us see that we really were living for the admiration and honor of people rather than for the glory of God. And that's, there's a big difference there. And I do want to say this real clearly. Every one of us has the temptation and the bent to become legalistic, to become like a Pharisee. I knew the word legalistic those first 15 years, but I, I didn't consider myself legalistic. I thought there were other people who were way too legalistic. But the more we went into this study and read what Galatians, what Paul was speaking to, writing to the Galatians, how he was saying, you know, if I'm serving men, trying to please men, I am not serving Christ. And we had to, of course, memorize that verse as well as the one Galatians 19 and 20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That opened our eyes to the grace of God. We recognized that we could not live by looking good to other people. Here we were in our spheres. My husband wanted to be a successful minister. And here we are in California where churches are huge and booming. And we have a little tiny church of 30 people when we moved there. And he thought, you know, he's preaching the word. People should be flocking to hear him preach. And people should all be loving one another because he was a very loving, personable man, still is. And I was thinking I should have a wonderful family with happy, obedient children. And everybody should be looking at us and saying, wow, what a wonderful family. But again, I said inside, I was thinking I'm a complete failure at this, being a mother and being consistent in training my children. And I realized that at that point, and 15 years of marriage, we had been thinking subconsciously, again, it was not consciously thinking, I've got to look good to everybody, but underneath, that's what we were doing. We've got to look good to other people. And we had to confess our Pharisaism. We had to confess that we had been living for the approval of men rather than for the glory of God. And that's when that phrase, it's not about me, it's about God, began to come alive to me and I began to actually use it. It's not about me. It doesn't matter that I had amazing parents. That doesn't make me a holy person. And so as we read Galatians, uh, Galatians 5, 6 says that you bite and devour one another with criticisms, condemnations. And that's exactly what I've been doing to my poor husband. Um, I told him he ought to do this and he ought to do that if he wanted to have a successful church. And by the fifth, before the fifth year, we had a couple of people leave the church and that absolutely devastated him. And he thought, I must be, I must be a terrible minister. I might as well become a plumber as much as he hated plumbing. He thought he might be a better plumber than a preacher. But as we learn this truth in Galatians, that through the Holy Spirit living in us, love could flow out of us and grace could flow out of us because his grace is flowing into us. Then we began to have joy 
in knowing Jesus. And I can honestly say that at the beginning of my walk with the Lord, I had joy knowing Jesus was my savior. But in the natural way of man, I was beginning, to, I had begun more and more in my marriage to think, well, if I get everything right, then God will be pleased with me and everybody will approve of me. But I had to confess to the women in my church in a Bible study, you know, you all may say that my children are well behaved, but we bite and devour one another by our words or by our tones in our house. And we also lose food, shoes before going to church. And we're also all fussy and whiny in the car and the van going to church. And we're normal. We're normal sinners. And uh, I began to be much more vulnerable with the women in the church. And when I began to be humble enough to be honest about my struggles, then I began to have real friends. Um, real people that said, oh, you're not way up there on a pedestal, right? <laughs> no, I'm not at all. And so uh, it really changed our lives, the grace of God. And he says, offer to God your sacrifice of praise. And we've often, we've, I'm sure as many of you young Christians would have thought, you know, why is it a sacrifice? Well, it takes time to praise God and to recognize who he is in your life and what he wants to do. Uh, so in that journal that I was trying to keep with reading my Bible, I decided one year that I was going to write down at least two things I was thankful for every day. And that made a huge difference to start thinking in thankful ways rather than in all the things that are wrong ways. And I have a phrase that I just love to use now. It's grace gets more and more amazing. The older you get, grace gets more amazing because God is not finished with us and he loves us so much more than we even can imagine or can believe. And so it's his obedience that gives us perseverance. It's his prayers that help us keep our eyes on the cross as that's what he did my will be, be done? No, thy will be done. So his perfect life on earth, his absolute will to do his father's will, which has saved us, is not about our trying hard to be good Christians. It's about accepting this grace and shedding it, sh spreading it out to our children, our families, and our friends, and whoever we see. So it's even more of a, of a truth to me today 44 years into being married, that it's about grace and it's about being kind to people and it's about giving people, uh, showing people that they are important instead of wishing people would go away because they're annoying. Um, even as a junior high student, I wish I had known that I could be kind and gracious to those kids that were annoying to me. But who am I? I'm just one of his many children. Um, all things come from you, said David, and of your own have we given you. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. And so my mother's influence in her obedience, her hard work, her speaking the truth and no vain words, it's still, it's still an example to me. Um, learning obedience through the things that she suffered as Jesus learned obedience through things he suffered. I see that that's what God is doing in each one of our lives. Trust him, trust him, trust him. He's saying to each of you, and I can't say it any, any other way except what my mother used to say, the, the hymn, trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus. And that trusting really means take on the righteousness of Christ into your own life. It doesn't mean, hey, I'm all about being a good Christian. It simply means living out what Christ has done for you to other people. Um, <clears throat> so what do I have to offer to women or to any of you, not all women here, when I speak? But the same thing that my mother did was to point to God. Point to God. Um, the same God that they trusted and loved and obeyed and they lived and they died for. This is my legacy to offer Christ to others. Um, it's their legacy, of course, to me, but to be able to 
as, as I said right before my mother's memorial service that I was in charge of, there's one on YouTube that was at Wheaton College. And I was just overwhelmed by how would we make this memorial service done well for my, for my mother and for the glory of God. And my father said, it's not your legacy to carry, it's Christ, it's Christ himself. And so we live out the love and life of Christ by dying to self and by doing things cheerfully, um, washing the dishes without complaining, cleaning the house, folding laundry. It's all about serving him, not about having a house that looks perfect, but just doing what God has put in front of us to do. And one of the, one of the wonderful things my mother continually spoke on was do the next thing. When she felt overwhelmed by the sorrow of losing her second husband, it was fixing a meal that helped her get through the next hour. What's the next thing that needs to be done? And I'm all about, I wanna go for a walk or go work in the garden, but God is saying, Val, there's things, there are things that need to be done inside the house. Um, so our tendency is to be legalistic. Our tendency is to look down on other people. And God is saying, we're all on a level at the foot of the cross. Jesus is our savior. We're all in the dust at the foot of Calvary because of our sin. And God has covered our sin by the righteousness of Christ. And that's what amazing grace is all about. And his grace gets more and more amazing. So I tried to teach my children and I know they're still learning it as we all do have to keep learning the same lessons over and over again, but to do God's will, you have to learn sacrifice in the littlest things first. You know, Jesus said, um, when you are faithful in little things, I will make you faithful in bigger things. Well, that's what you moms have to teach your little children, being obedient in the little things so that they can grow up to be faithful in bigger things. And I'm still learning to be faithful in the little things. Um, that's what God has put in front of me. And But to offer Christ to other people rather than it's all about me and how amazing I am because I'm the daughter of Jim and Elizabeth. No, it's all about him and what he has done to save us. That's about all that I have. Um, questions or if there's something, uh, uh, Carl did ask me to mention some of the other books and I'm so glad that uh, Goodwill Writes, is it called, Sashko, Goodwill Writes? That's correct, yes. Is the publisher that is uh, translating some of my mother's books into Poli Polish. And I, I just want to mention a book that was published right before my book, Devotedly. It was called Suffering is Never for Nothing. And my mother had written a book called A Path Through Suffering. And of course, going through two widowhoods. And one of them, uh, my stepfather with cancer, was real suffering. Um, but that she, the book, A Path Through Suffering, is different from the book, uh, Suffering is Never for Nothing. And the reason for that is because as she grew in her, uh, she expanded her talks on suffering, <clears throat> she did quite a few um, speeches or talks in different places on suffering. <clears throat> and one of, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> one of the dear ladies, dear friends of my mother's uh, said, what's happened to the transcripts for all of those talks? And uh, my mother said, they're in cassette tapes underneath my bed in a big box. And so <clears throat> she said, would you mind if, uh, my mother said, if you'd like to transcribe them, I'd be happy for you to do that. So Margaret Ashmore did the work of typing out all of the talks and as uh, the publisher and my agent read through those talks and then read through A Path Through Suffering, they realized this was new material. There was more and more material on suffering. So those are two different books, but I would highly recommend them. Another one of my mother's, one of my favorites that my mother wrote is uh, Passion and Purity because it, of course it is about uh, my mother and father's courtship. And she keeps it very simple and short. 
And that's why Devotedly is such a long book because there was so much to share from their letters to each other uh, that I just, when I started reading my father's letters, I just couldn't get over the depth of his spirituality. And I have to share this little story. I don't know how many of you already know this, but when my mother gave me my father's letters, she said, Val, you know, I hope that someday you'll have time to read them. Right now you have most of your children at home, seven at home at the time. She said, so you don't have time to read these, but someday you'll want to sit down and read them. And she said, and it's so sad that he destroyed all of my letters. And I thought, wow, yeah, that is really sad. So in 2011, when my, old, my youngest child was just about graduated from high school, uh, somebody, two different people within two months of each other that didn't know each other asked me what had happened to my father's letters or the, the, any of the love letters of my parents. And I said, well, I know that my mother told me my mother's letters were destroyed, and, but she did give me all of her, my father's letters. So I started looking for them, found, found them in the bottom of a trunk of memorabilia. So so thrilled to find them. And as I started to read them, I thought, these have got to be published. And so I thought, well, I'll use my mother's journals that she had given me from 1948 to 1956, 58. Uh, of course, he died in 1956. Um, I'll use the journals and I'll use his letters and see if I can kind of combine what she's saying, what he's saying. It, it, the more I tried to do that, the more complicated and difficult it was. But I was in my mother's attic the year after she died looking for his original journal and couldn't find it. I called Wheaton College and asked if they had his original journal and they said, yes, they had it, but it had really fallen apart because of jungle uh, rot. And he said, but the guy that's in charge of the archives, he said, do you know that the journals have everything that was in his original? See, I was thinking there might be stuff that was not in the published journals. And so he said, so really when you read your, the journals of Elliot, it's everything. And so I was looking still for some other things, memorabilia, and I came upon the Ecuador trunk. And in the very bottom of the trunk were my mother's letters to my father. And that she had thought, really, they were gone. So you can imagine my thrill when I found those. And I took them home and began to just relish every page. And just, again, the depth of spirituality, the depth of commitment, the beautiful writing the way they wrote, which we have lost so much of because we use texting most of the time, um, was just incredible. But the fa sad thing again, as I was working on the book, was the first year of her letters seemed to be gone. And so the book is published with her letters from 1949 on. And do you know that the chairman of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, Kathy Reeg, was going through everything in my mother's house when Lars was selling their house and she found the first year's letters of my mother. So eventually those will get published. We're not sure whether it will be in a new edition of Devotedly or whether it will be in a separate little book, but I was so, again, so amazed and thrilled that God had preserved them. So let's see, another book. Um, people keep telling me that 12 baskets of crumbs and, oh, well, there's there's daily light. Uh, there's a there's a Carl. You have to help me. The book about the the daily devotions. I can't think of it. You think of the the lamp unto my feet. Okay, yeah. lamp unto me my feet is a beautiful. It's not a year long devotional, but it's definitely two paragraphs per day. You can read and her thoughts, her essays on what it means to obey and trust are wonderful in that. And that is still being published. But the one I met mentioned, 12 Baskets of Crumbs, um, is not. But somebody just wrote to me today and asked, is that being published? And I'm hoping that someday it will be. And it's a wonderful book of just many little vignettes and her essays. Um, that's all the books I can think of right now. The Course, The Shadow of the Almighty, my father's uh, biography and um, as you know, most of you know, mo my mother wrote about 30 books. So they're wonderful. <laughs> and I'm hoping that this book can be republished. This is uh, My Jungle Memories. 
and I actually have two publishers looking at it again. They said for when it went out of print in 2012, no publisher was interested because children's books were not really in being marketed well. And uh, also that they're expensive when they have colored pictures. So I'm praying that I can republish it in a, a, a shorter form so that younger children can enjoy it even more. But that name is Pili Pinto, and that's what the Quechua Indians called me. It means butterfly. Any questions? Thank by you. the way, by the way, Valerie, before Sashko uh, 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 um, uh, continues, yeah, we'll we'll do our best to see if we can uh, we can get some interest so we can see that book back in. Uh, back. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Somebody has actually asked about uh, this book and, and commented on how difficult it is to get. Um, so it's out of print and currently it, it, you, you can't buy it anywhere. Is that right? You can buy it, but it's ridiculously expensive. It's people that bought a bunch of them and now they sell them. Uh, so that happens. And uh, I heard somebody say that they saw it for $135, but I have a friend that bought it for $35 on Amazon. So, you know, it might be found cheaper. I, I doubt it, but that's, that's what happens. Well, we're, we're looking forward to that being published again. Now, Valerie, could you please tell us um, which titles, which particular books are we to be expecting in the nearest future? Say maybe, is there anything coming out this year? Uh, you mean brand new books or my book, my mother's books republished? Your, your mother's books and also your, your books as well. Well, um, as I said, Ellen Vaughn is doing a second volume of, of the biography. And I doubt that that would come out before, what is this, 2021? I doubt it would come out before 2023, but maybe the, the end of 2022. Um, Carl has asked me to work on a book about Amy Carmichael's devotions. She had many books that had many devotional uh, writings in them. So with Margaret Ashmore, the same one that transcribed all of those tapes into the book, uh, Suffering is Never for Nothing, she is going to work with me on a book on Amy Carmichael, and maybe two, we don't know yet, but uh, that's one thing. And then I, um, I don't plan, I, I'm, I don't consider myself a writer. It is very challenging for me. So I don't know what will come in the future, but my mother's books that have been recently repackaged are The Shadow of the Almighty as a different cover. It's got a, a painting of my dad on the front. And then um, the one that is about I'm so sorry, I didn't write this down now. It's, it's um, about trusting for eternity, but I can't think of the name of it. <laughs> oh, it's been, it's been, I know that my mother's first year of, of missionary work was originally called These Strange Ashes, but now it is called... Um, the Cure in the Everlasting Arms is one, Valerie. Okay, that's the one I was trying to think of just a second ago. Secure, secure in the Everlasting Arms has been repackaged, but the first year of her missionary life is now called <laughs> the, can you think of it, Kathy? Oh, gosh. It's a new title, and it's very different. No, it's No it's, Graven, not No Graven Image. No, no Graven Image is her novel. That's right. I don't know. Okay, it'll come to me, I think, uh, while we're done. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to look at all these faces and then also be thinking of the name of that book, so I'm sorry. I'll look that up. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. So David writes here, my father was in the military uh, during the war. Um, he went uh, with Jim to Wheaton and wondering if Jim had any connections with the military during World War II. No, he was a conscientious objector. Uh, growing up in the Plymouth Brethren Assemblies, uh, he definitely did not believe that men should go to war. So he was able to opt out of being a soldier when they were all being drafted. And the other man that worked with him among the Quechua Indians, uh, Pete Fleming, was also a conscientious objector. He was also Plymouth Brethren. Um, but the other three guys, 
I think at least two of them, Roger Udarian and Nate Saint had been in the army, so they had lots of discussions about going into the Aukas uh, with a gun or a couple of guns to, for self-defense. Of course, they didn't want to kill any Aukas, but they also knew that because of panthers or poisonous snakes, they might need a gun. So they did take a couple of guns in. Uh, but nothing, the conscientious objector issue was not, uh, there's not a whole lot of writing between my mother and dad about that at all. And my mother had two brothers that were in the military. Mm -hmm. um, so Valerie, you moved uh, to the States when you were eight, is that right? That's eight and a half, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so uh, do you remember anything from that time? Uh, how would you describe your culture shock if there was such thing? What are some of the vivid memories from that time? What, what surprised you, shocked you culturally? I'm not sure I was truly shocked. Um, because we had seen the mountains around Quito, a lot from flying in and out of Shandia and Quito. I mean, Shalmeta <clears throat> is where the uh, MAF, Missionary Aviation Fellowship Planes, had their headquarters. Um, so seeing those mountains, when we moved to New Hampshire, there are gorgeous mountains in New Hampshire. So that was a, a homecoming almost for me. I mean, of course, we weren't in a jungle, but we had woods around us and it was wonderful. I was allowed to roam free through the woods and went down to a river, it was not a deep river. I played and played just like I had in the jungle. I don't remember being terribly lonely though, um, because my mother found two girls that were going to be in my class that I got together with a couple of times before school started. I don't know how she found them, but the Lord um, led her to them. And I'm very grateful for those two friends because they welcomed me into their class as I had to come in a little bit late that first day as the bus drove right by me as it was to pick me up. And I was all ready to be picked up and it went on up the mountain. And what my mother had not heard him say was that he was going to pick me up on the way back down from the mountain. So that was my first sorrow, you know, like I thought I was going to school today and I'm already with my new lunchbox and my new clothes and all this. But anyway, these two girls saw me come into the room and the teacher said, we have a new girl. All the other students were already seated. And so I was very self-conscious. And uh, these two girls whispered to me, come here, Valerie, come sit by us. So they had a place for me. And I just remember the first week or two of school being a little bit scared, a little bit nervous because I'd never been in that setting before. But the Lord just, the Lord helped me to be adaptable. I have that kind of personality anyway. I like changes. So it was, it was uh, fun. Uh, I, I wasn't real crazy with my teacher, but I was thankful, thankful for um, just being able to go to a small school and have some good friends. And uh, my fifth and sixth grade teacher was absolutely fantastic. And so I loved her dearly. And I remember the excitement of my mother saying, let's have her over for supper. And we had her for dinner one night and she loved her too. And so I don't remember any huge shocks. I really don't. It was an easy adjustment for me. Um, I did miss my friends. Probably the hardest thing was when we went back to Ecuador when I was the age of 11. We went for Marge Saint's wedding to Abe Vanderpoy. She got married in Quito, Ecuador. And so we went to see the Indians that we had lived with just three years before, the Quichuas. And then we went to see the Alcas too, the Waurani. And I was so sad because I'd completely forgotten the language, even though my mother had tried very hard to help me keep speaking it. She kept those languages in her head the rest of her life. Uh, she didn't speak it much when she had dementia, but she certainly did remember it in 1996 when we went down to Ecuador and saw the Waurani and the Quichuas, many of the same ones that we had lived with. So um, she was amazing with her, with her understanding of languages and perfect imitation too. <clears throat> um, Valerie, so if, if Jim thought that Americans were too comfortable and satisfied back in the 50s. What do you think he would say now? <laughs> he would be horrified, <laughs> just as my mother would be horrified too. There's just way too much silk and self as I read that poem. There's too much of this expectation of, I need to be comfortable, it's about me, it's about what I want. 
uh, it's about how I feel. And she, she would have just decried that continuously is it's not about our feelings that yes god gave us feelings they're not all wrong but we are not to be focused on how i feel about everything and that's what happened in the 60s and 70s that that kind of jargon started coming out more and more and she just shook her head in disgust most of the time um Valerie, what are some key pieces of advice that you would have for families today? We have a number of questions um, along those lines, um, uh, raising teenagers, raising young children. Uh, what are some of the things that you would uh, say to, to young families, mothers? Um, and also, which uh, of Elizabeth Elliot's books would you recommend for reading on, the, on that issue? Yes, I would recommend my mother's book called The Shaping of a Christian Family. And she would very strongly say it is not a prescription for raising children. It is a description of a Christian family. So when I read it, she had to remind me of that several times because I said, oh, mama, I could never, I could never raise children the way grandma and grandpa Howard did, her parents. And she said, well, they were an unusual couple and in every couple, there's there's individual uh, gifts, and so every family is going to be different. Um, the most important thing is to teach obedience and respect to your children. That is very, very, very important. And of course, I'm dealing with seeing my own children now, trying to teach their children obedience. Uh, our our oldest grandchild is 15. She's a lovely young girl, uh, very gifted in both music and art. Um, and, and Elizabeth, her mother, and her husband, Matt, have done well at teaching their children to obey. And I do really strongly encourage moms, don't read everything that's on the internet about how to parent. It's really about following God's principles. So Proverbs is still a wonderful book in teaching how to parent. Um, the young, other children are very young. The oldest in the States is four years old and the others are younger. So we're, we're watching and praying all the time. Um, I would say my own struggle with being consistent had to do a lot with my own spontaneous uh, personality. Some days wanting to be very disciplined and other days wanting to just say, oh, forget it, it's too hard but it takes real serious commitment to train to teach our children obedience and i would just encourage moms and dads who have children at home don't give up no matter how difficult the child is and i have to tell a story about this at how much time we have about 20 more minutes is that right yep. um my youngest child I have four very strong-willed, or would, my mother would say willful children, and I have four pretty compliant children. So as they were growing up, those four that were very willful were the difficult ones. But my youngest one was the most persevering, stubborn child of the four. And my second one, Elizabeth, the mother of those four in England, was very, very persevering. But then Sarah came along as the last one, and I realized that because I knew she was going to be my last, my husband said we were done with having children. He's nine years older than I. And uh, I had to really discipline myself to seriously work with Sarah. And uh, she is now a medical student, has been determined to be a doctor since she was about seven years old. And we're very, very thankful and proud that she has that determined spirit. Um, she's about to graduate from Liberty University in May. but. I remember one night I was trying to train her to sleep through the night because I had finished nursing her and she would wake up at exactly the same time she still had been nursed. She wanted to be nursed and I would just tell her, no, we're done. And I'd give her water and I'd say, it's time to go back to sleep. But she'd wake up screaming, mad. And I went in and said, mama has to spank you. And I believed in using a paint stick, which is the rod that is in Proverbs. I don't believe in beating a child. I believe in giving a good whack on the back of the leg and uh, hard enough that hurts, but not to you know, hurt them too much, of course. And parents have to be very careful with their own 
issue of anger and, and disciplining themselves to train their children rightly. So I would, had three nights in a row had gone in to deal with this screaming. I said, Sarah, if you wake up, you can call mama if you want some water, but you're to go back to sleep. And after the little quick quack on the back of her legs, she would keep crying, but she wouldn't scream. I said, you cannot scream. Um, but on the third night, I was thinking, this isn't working. She's just not getting this. So Lord, is there something else I'm supposed to do? And you know what verse came to me? I knew it was the Holy Spirit. All discipline for the moment seems, in the, old, in the King James, it says most sorrowful. It seems painful. But afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And I knew that God was saying, persevere. You have to give her that spank again. And you know, it lasted maybe two more nights that she woke up. And after that, she slept through the night. So persevere with children that are very difficult. Don't give up on teaching them to obey. They must understand authority. Children, parents can have the voice of authority with firmness and kindness. They do not have to be yelling. They do not have to be screaming at their kids. And if you say, I'm gonna to count to three, then you are training your children to delay obedience. And delayed obedience is disobedience. So I would say, teach your children the first time to come. And two simple commands that you give to a little child, no and come. And <clears throat> I was trying it out with my two-year-old grandson I was just with, because he just had a little brother born. And he just looked at me. And I knew that his parents were working on training him. And I said, Jackson, come. And he just stood there. He's about six, eight feet away from me. I said, come. He stood there and looked at me. And I stood there and looked at him. I knew that I didn't have the place to spank him because they were still discussing about spanking. Um, but I just looked at him. I said, Jackson, grandmama said, come. And he suddenly decided in his little heart, well, I guess I better go. And he came to me. There wasn't any crying. But <clears throat> that teaching the one, the first time obedience is very hard. I am not going to say it's easy. I don't want it to sound like, yeah, it can be done. It can be done, but with the help of the Lord, because, you know, the Lord perseveres with us. He perseveres with us. And uh, so... I would encourage parents not to give up on difficult children, children that don't want to obey, children that want their own way. I remember when Elizabeth was about eight. She was whining, she was manipulative. I had done probably too much, yes, not probably. I was doing too much dealing, working out things with her, trying to help her be happy. And I remember one day thinking, it is not about Elizabeth's happiness. It is about teaching her obedience and respect. And my husband had said to me in that same year, Val, you let Elizabeth argue with you way too much. And I knew he was right. So I began to say, it helped me to say this as well as it helped Elizabeth to hear, I am the mother, Elizabeth. You cannot whine and fuss and get your way. Mama said no. And uh, to, to keep it simple like that, you know, instead of trying to make deals or saying, if you do this, then you can do this. And if you don't get this, then you, can, you won't have, it's just too difficult for young children to follow through on a reasoning like that, on a, on a dealing things. Uh, I just, I think they need clear commands and they need clear, quick punishment. That is not in what, what my daughter and her husband are doing right now with Jackson is they are putting him on a chair, which I had suggested too, <clears throat> and setting a timer for a certain amount of time if he's throwing a fit. They put him there and they say, you can't throw a fit at the table. You can't throw a fit if we tell you we're going upstairs. And so he sits there. He's for a couple of times, he would cry. But the other times he just sat there realizing this was his punishment. And when the timer rang, he was happy, got down and did what he was supposed to do. So it just takes mom and dad talking to each other about what is a, what is a good consequence, you know, that's reasonable. Um, I would not advocate beating at all. I just truly believe that the child has to have some kind of hurt uh, to see that their disobedience has a consequence. 
So if it's hurt by being left on a chair, I used to have a, a whining chair. If they were whining too much, they had to sit on the whining chair until the fussiness was gone. And that worked, it was great. But direct disobedience, uh, direct disrespect really has to be dealt with pretty seriously. If it's allowed when they're little, it gets worse and worse, especially as teenagers. Thank you, Valerie. Um, earlier, you referenced two books that you read that had big influence on you. One was on prayer. Could you please repeat those titles? Yes, I forgot to mention more about the prayer book, but the first one was called A Severe Mercy by Sheldon Van Auken, A-U-K-E-N. And it's a true story of a young couple who become Christians after they've been married. And her excitement, this is what really challenged me to read the Bible 30 days in a row. Her excitement over reading the Bible convicted me as a Christian. I thought, I've been a Christian all my life. I've never really been that excited to read the Bible. And so I'm going to ask the Lord to show me. And I didn't finish that part of the story is that when I found that verse, um, thy words were found and thy words became, and I ate them and they became to me the joy and delight of my life. Um, it was really true that I needed the word of God daily. So the, that, that second book I actually found in those following two weeks of that 30 day commitment, uh, we went to Dallas to visit Walt's parents whose father, his father had just had a heart attack and he was between death and life. And he said he felt like Paul betwixt and between wanting to be with Christ, but also knowing he still had work to do. And I was in a bookstore during that two weeks and saw that book, What Happens When Women Pray by Evelyn Christensen. It was written, I believe in the seventies. And it really opened my eyes to how women's work and prayer with women could really help the women in the church. And so a little Bible study I'd been doing once a month with the women in that church in Louisiana, which I had no clue what I was doing because I had never taught a Bible study. But this book opened my eyes to the possibility and joy of prayer about everything. And I tried to show from reading that book to those women, tried to show them it's not just about praying for people's physical ailments. It's about praying for God's glory to be seen in their lives, uh, in their husbands and children's lives. And it just became a much more alive group when we started to say, okay, let's be real about what we're really worried about, what we're really longing for. And uh, God answers prayer. And he answers it sometimes in very unusual ways or ways that we have to wait for a long time before he answers. But it was, it really opened my heart to prayer. And, uh, helped my relationship with those women in Louisiana. Valerie, the book yes. that you were referring to, um, These Strange Ashes yes. of Your Mother. Yes. And became, it's been changed, made for the journey. Made for the journey. Thank you so much, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the book of my mother's first year as a missionary, and it was a very surprisingly disappointing years because, year because she lost everything that she'd worked on for about nine months. And it wasn't her fault that it was lost. It got stolen and then the man who was her interpreter got murdered. And so that was a group of Indians on the western side of the Andes before my mother and dad got married. So it used to be called These Strange Ashes, could probably still be found in used bookstores. Um, but also it's now called Made for the Journey. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, another question is about Ecuador. So you've mentioned earlier today that um, you and your mother have, you actually visited Ecuador in the 90s, if I remember correctly. Um, and some people are asking, uh, have you ever taken uh, any of your children there? Have you traveled there with them? Uh, did they see, did yes. they get to see the place? Yes. Just our oldest one, 1996, my mother and her husband invited my husband and me to go uh, to Ecuador and meet in Quito. We were actually celebrating the 40th anniversary of the death of, I, mean, I don't know if you say celebrating, but it was a memorial service at the HCJB radio station. Um, and we met Steve Saint there, who is Marge Saint's son, Nate Saint's son. 
And our son, Walter, was actually living with my uncle, Bert, who is my father's older brother, who's now in heaven also. And Uncle Bert had been a missionary in, in Peru for many years at that time. And by the time he died, I believe it had been 63 years of work in Peru. And uh, so our son, Walter, came to see us when he was in Peru. It was an unbelievable way that God allowed him to get on a bus for 36 hours, cross the border between Peru and Ecuador, which is always chancy. You never know what's going to happen at the borders. Um, he got to meet us right at the airport in Quito, and he got to be with us as we went to visit the Quichuas, as well as going to visit the Waurani. It was an, a wonderful trip, and a very unusual thing happened. I think I still have a few more minutes to say this. Uh, we were visiting the Quichua Indians in the house that my dad built. Some Quichuas had decided it had been empty all these years. They might as well move in, and it unfortunately had broken up any harmony that was in the tribe of Kich was in that little village called Shandia. Um, one family felt it was their right to move into the house. The other family said, well, we helped build it. We helped Mr. Jim Jaime Elliott build it too. So we should be able to move in. So there was a huge rift between those two families. And so when we got to Shandia, it was very sad to see that the Kich was, were, it was all about who was living in my father's house. And so we, are, we go up to the house and of course everything's overgrown, nothing looks quite the same, the house a little dilapidated, but we sit down to sit with the Quichuas and of course my mother could still speak Quichua and they brought us um, boiled eggs and chicha, that manioc drink that I mentioned. And so my mother, Lars, my husband, my son, Walter, our oldest, we're all sitting there eating when a blonde leather clad young man walks through the jungle to the house. And my mother said to him in Spanish, thinking he might be Spanish, um, he actually asked first, he said, is this the house of Jim Elliot? And he asked that in Spanish and my mother answered him in Spanish. And he was just overcome because my mother said, and I happen to be Jim Elliot's wife and this is her, our daughter and this is her husband and this is their son. and." Uh, he just said, well, I read through Gates of Splendor while I was in Germany and I decided to go visit Ecuador and thought I might start learning Spanish and do some mission work in, in Ecuador. And I thought I'd come see Jim Elliott's house. And it just happened that we were there on that very day. <laughs> so my mother was thrilled that somebody was coming to see it. Um, and we just had a nice visit, of course, because she could still speak Quechua. She explained that to the Quechua Indians and she could still speak Spanish. So that was a huge gift from the Lord that day. Did I answer the question? I can't remember what <laughs> I was going. I think you did. Yes, yes. Your experience with Ecuador. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, it, it's a beautiful country and I would love to go back. I've never um, had any notion or desire that we should go work among the Indians. Uh, my husband and I had three years in Africa and we just felt that we should be in the States because of my mother's dementia. And also when our, our son, our seventh child had just been diagnosed with something called Charcot-Marie Tooth, which is a degenerative neuromuscular disease. And so in, in uh, 2008, we came back and felt like we needed to deal with him as well as seeing my mother more often. Thank you. We, we've not been able to do any more mission work, but we're doing mission work wherever we are. So speaking of which, um, what's next for you, Valerie? We, we, you mentioned, um, or we actually, I think I, m I may have mentioned that you are planning to uh, write two more books. Some people would like to know what they are going to be about. And, and just in general, um, where is God leading you? Um, do you know where your next adventure might be? Oh, well, my husband being retired loves where we are right now. So we hope to stay here at least 10 years. He will be 84 when 10 years are up. And we um, are going to an evangelical Presbyterian church, which to me is wonderful. We had really struggled finding the church that we were supposed to go to. And um, I feel that we can both serve there. So I'm excited about that. And Writing is, of course, it's in in the cards for me, but as I said, it's not an easy thing. And uh, Carl has been a huge encouragement to me to to work on this Amy Carmichael devotional. And 
I hope that I can put out at least a little pamphlet for parents. Um, I love, I want to tell you parents this to find it. It's online, I'm quite sure. It's a little pamphlet called, used to be called Children, Fun or Fren Frenzy by Al and Pat Fabrizio. It is now called Children Under Loving Command. And it is simply about using the rod and teaching obedience. It's a very clear, simple explanation of how to train a little toddler to obey. And it really was a godsend to me. With our oldest son was quite easy to train, but I knew I needed that pamphlet. Just as my mother had, had taught me and my grandmother too, children must obey from an early age. Once you get that habit into them, they're going to be much happier children. So Children Under Loving Command by Al and Pat Fabrizio. So I'd love to write something maybe a little fuller. Um, their main thing is just saying one command and using the rod for punishment. And but as I said, it's a little pamphlet. I'd love to write something a little more than just teaching obedience, but I do write very irregularly uh, a letter to younger moms and trying to encourage them, just giving them hints. Uh, I know that I'm not an expert. My husband says we cannot go out doing parenting seminars. Um, we are very thankful for the way our children have grown up and they all went to college. We homeschooled them at least through part of high school but I was not a fantastic homeschooler. I just know the grace of God covers a lot of mistakes. And uh, so we, we want to focus more on his grace. My husband likes to say our children were homed, not necessarily homeschooled. They were homed. So we taught them lots about responsibility and they're all good workers. So we're very thankful about that. And they all got to learn to read and write and do arithmetic. <laughs> but beyond that, in the sciences, we were a little weak. Anyway. Um, I don't know. I do speak some. Uh, I would love for my husband to go with me wherever I speak. Uh, he doesn't really want to sell books as my mother's husband did regularly, but uh, he's a great encouragement to me. And our next place, we will be trusting that the Lord will get us there because of COVID and vaccines and all that. Uh, Washington, at the end of March, we plan to be at a homeschool conference in Washington. Um, I have a couple of other possible speaking engagements. All of my engagements were canceled last year because of COVID, so that's fine. I was glad to be home and, of course, worked a little more on that book that I was working on. Um, I think just being a servant right here in my neighborhood is really really a strong call to me. Uh, I love Rosaria Butterfield's book. Have you seen it, Sashko? Um, I've seen it, a lot of her books, but okay. I don't think I've seen any of them. This particular one. one is called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. That one, yes. Mm -hmm. Crossroads. It, yep. it is wonderful, and it's very challenging. She definitely has a special gift to have people over every day, but it was very convicting to both Walt and me as we live in a a kind of spread out neighborhood, so we're not right next to each other in other houses, but I feel very strongly that we should be opening our home to our neighbors soon. I hope sooner rather than later because of this pandemic, but um, that was a very convicting and strong, helpful book for us because we did, we, we were very hospitable as far as at least once a week having people in our home when our children were growing up but um, want to continue that right here. So I don't, I don't have any aspirations for doing bigger, greater things. <laughs> Just we're to be servants right where we are. Valerie, before we wrap up, just one last question from me. Uh, I'm in my early thirties, uh, my wife and I, we, we don't have children yet, but um, the, we see more and more um, young parents uh, going for this stress, Free, I'm not sure what, what, what you call that in, in English, but uh, the raising of your children where you're not supposed to be stressing them, you're not supposed to be saying no, um, and, and they will be learning for themselves. Um, what's your take on that? How do you uh, even talk to people like this? What do you say? Um, and in general, what's, what's your approach? Well, the sad thing is that they're not, most young couples are not open to asking older parents their advice. And even when my husband and I were 
wanting his parents' advice. We lived only two and a half hours from them when we lived in Louisiana. They were very reluctant to give us a whole lot of advice. Um, they were clear on, yes, you teach them obedience and respect and you love them. And they were both very gracious, gracious people. And so when younger people don't want to ask older people advice, but rather look on the internet for their next bit of advice, I, I don't know what to say except to pray for them. Uh, pray that the Lord will give them a desire to ask people who have raised children. Um, I'm, very, I'm just very thankful that my mother was so clear in how it should be done. I think she was right, but I can't, I can't argue with my own children if they choose not to spank. Um, it's, it's, it is what they choose to do as well as we pray, my husband and I pray. I don't know that I've answered your question. I don't, I don't agree with permissiveness. I don't agree that their, their little spirits will be broken and hurt if they're taught uh, with, with strictness. And I don't mean strictness in a mean way at all. I mean firmness. I think um, parents must be loving and they must be kind and they must mean what they say. They cannot give vain threats. Yeah. Um, and and a, a punishment has to be real, it has to be serious, and it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be days, even grounding. My mother, I don't think I was ever grounded, though I did do some foolish things, and she probably, maybe one time I was grounded. But just uh, a punishment is, is better to be quick. It needs to be quick and serious, and then it's done, because then you show your kids your grace again, the Lord's grace. And I don't, I don't know what to say to young people who don't are not interested. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I suppose pray. Prayer is a, it's a good, good answer, good solution for that. Uh, Valerie, we're mindful of, of time, and we know you have further arrangements for, for the rest of the day. Um, just a big, big thank you for, for your time today um huge thank you uh we have received a couple of appreciation notes uh that i'm going to pass on to you um after after the meeting um and your your ministry your your parents ministry has been uh impacting uh, people for 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 decades and and it's just such a such a great blessing to to be able to um just hear from you today and just um soak in all this all this wisdom so big big thank, thank you. you thank you for having me and i i would just say the wisdom is in the bible and we've got to keep focusing on reading what god's word says it's the truth it's the absolute truth we cannot get away from it though everybody tries to get away from it um we just uh meditating on his word is maybe hard but it's also it brings wisdom and discernment so I am very thankful that you asked me to talk. I again don't feel you know anything like uh the the huge perseverance and determination that my parents have. I'm still trying to learn that. Still trying to be more persevering than I have been. Mm. Thank you, Valerie. Um, for those of you, uh, for our participants who uh, have been asking about this, um, the recording of this um, webinar will be available. Uh, we will send you the link uh, within the next couple of days. Hopefully, this uh, still, we'll, we'll be able to do that still this weekend. Um, uh, Elizabeth Elliot's books um, and Valerie's are available uh, and listed on Elizabeth Elliot's Foundation's website. Um, they are available for, for purchasing, they are available for licensing, should someone want to translate them into a foreign language. Um, before we wrap up, uh, Kathy, Kathy Reach, are you, are you with us here? Her name is there. I, I, I am, I am. I, Sorry, I, I've not wanted to distract from Valerie, so I stayed blank. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Kathy, could you just briefly let us know uh, what are some of the resources we could be coming for to Elizabeth Elliott's um, uh, foundation website? Um, is, is there anything, any announcements that we should be aware of? 
Well, we are so thrilled to be able to steward this legacy and uh, Valerie's support and encouragement in this and serving on the board with us. Um, we are going to be bringing more and more resources. We keep unearthing all of these talks of Elizabeth's. So we have just really hit the surface. So just keep watching and, and waiting and register, um, sign up for the newsletters and announcements and you'll see uh, soon there will be more and more videos, more and more uh, for talks and even, even books coming about. So it's exciting, exciting days ahead. Yes. And if I may say the, the website for uh, is elizabethelliot.org, correct? Yes, it is. Uh, and also you may want to go to the uh, Facebook page. Yes, Elizabeth There's Elliot Foundation, correct? Exactly. There's Instagram, there's Facebook, um, there's Twitter even. And also um, there is a place to sign up for a devotional, which we send out weekly, which are excerpts from some of her books or her newsletters of the past and great wisdom, great encouragement. I just encourage you to just continue to follow us. We'll, yeah. we'll, uh, 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 Sashko will send out, uh, a, um, a, as, as he mentioned, a link to the recording and also the links to the Facebook, the web, uh, the web page, uh, I mean the website, and uh, that will help uh, everyone to keep tabs on what will come. And hopefully, God willing, we'll have uh, other events like, uh, like, like this, including hopefully uh, Val. We'll give Val a little rest because she's been speaking for such a long time, and then perhaps uh, later this year, invite her uh, once again to speak on, uh, on, on relevant topics. Um, Sashko, over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, if, if you have uh, any, any questions, please write uh, to this email address, info at goodwillrights.com, info at goodwillrights.com and we'll be happy to, to answer uh, any of your questions. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook uh, and Instagram, and that's where we uh, uh, publish uh, some of the daily quotes, and um, quite a few of those have actually been taken from Elizabeth Elliot's books, so that's, that's another channel to, uh, to stay tuned and uh, just to be reminded about, um, about the, the titles that Elizabeth uh, produced and uh, um, that's just another way to uh, to stay stay in touch as well. Um, before we go, uh, once again, big thank you to everybody who who participated, and uh, let's just bow our heads uh, and, and and pray before we go. Father, we thank you so much for um, Valerie's um, ministry, for the life for her life, for the life of her parents, for uh, all this legacy, um, as indeed as Kathy. Uh, mentioned that we are still unpacking and then discovering. Lord, we pray that um, uh, all that wisdom and, and legacy would be uh, distributed among young people, that young people would uh, want to, to listen, and that uh, the books would be translated into even more uh, languages, uh, and that this just would still be uh, alive uh, decades, from, decades from now and centuries from now. Lord, we pray that um, your name would be glorified through uh, Valerie's ministry. And uh, we just were so grateful for, um, for her talk today and for what she was sharing with us. And we were so thankful to you and, and uh, for, your, for your word that uh, contains uh, all, the, all the wisdom that we need for, for godly living. Lord, we pray that you would bless us uh, today and tonight. Uh, with um, everyone, every participant, with um, whatever we have left uh, or planned for, for this day and for this weekend and tomorrow as we, as we worship with uh, our congregations, whether it's uh, live or um, online, we pray that you would receive all the glory that belongs to you only. Lord, we pray about all these things in the name of our Savior. Amen. 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 Once again, thank you. thank you everyone for your participation and uh, you can expect an email from us within the next couple of days. Thank you. God bless everyone. God bless.